Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company uh, for this, the, the first of our annual collaborations uh, with the New York University Creative Writing Program. Uh, I've been advised that um, the, this collaboration has been going on so long now that I shouldn't mention exactly how many years it's been because it just makes everyone involved feel really old. But all I will say is that it's been a collaboration which we uh, have cherished over the years and continue to cherish and continues to produce some of the most exciting events that we have at Shakespeare and Company, and tonight is no exception. Uh, we're thrilled to welcome uh, John Freeman back uh, for another another Freeman's panel. I think this is the fourth or fifth we've done together. They're always stimulating, always interesting, and I think you're in for a wonderful night tonight. We're also delighted to welcome for the first time Nadifa, Mariana, and Zhao Lu, uh, all of whom are new friends to Shakespeare and Company, but um, hopefully over the years will become old friends very quickly. Um, I'm not going to give any full introduction. You're not here to uh, listen to, my, just to me speak, so please just join me in welcoming John Freeman, Nadifa Mohammed, Mariana Enriquez, and Jal Hugo to Shakespeare and Company. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, I've been teaching here so long, I needed glasses uh, in the interim. Thank you for coming out uh, uh, on this, this night of football. Um, lots of other interesting things happen while people kick a ball around a field. Um, some of them write novels, and we're here to talk about that tonight. Um, all three of these writers, uh, to my mind, are one of the, are reasons why it's a good time to be alive as a reader um, and as an editor uh, of a literary journal. Um, they're all working with history in different ways, from the gothic and horror short stories of Marianne Enriquez to the maximalist and strange and, and document-filled novels of Jalu Guo, including her recent memoir, and Nadifa's historical novels, um, two of them set in Somaliland, and the next one that she's about to publish um, in Wales in the 1950s, when a Somali sailor is framed for a crime he didn't commit. Um, because they're, they might be new to you, um, I'm going to blitz through uh, 62 years of living, or 82 years. Um, so bear with me as I introduce them to you. Um, and then we're going to have a conversation around some of the ideas and, and conversations that, that emerge from their books. Notably, you know, how does one put history into a book without recreating it? Um, does evil exist? Or is it simply a category in which we apply to people to kick them out of societies? What kind of narrative fields does the erotic open up? Um, and how are these writers going to deal with the, the present tense and the kind of ongoing emergencies around the world that they're living close to um, and are witnesses of? So uh, Mariana Enriquez, sitting in the middle, um, with a nice scowl, but a friendly face. Um, <laughs> she was born. <laughs> <laughs> Always antagonize your, your panelists. Uh, that's, that's my motto. Um, she was born in 1973 in Buenos Aires, uh, grew up and around the city, studied journalism in university, and published You're Gonna Hate Her, her first novel, when she was 21. Um, it was called Going Down is the Worst, uh, to translate it into English. Um, it tells the tale of a trio of kids. One is a prostitute, a kind of fallen angel, and their life going to nightclubs and bars of the late 1980s Buenos Aires as the city was beginning to fall apart. Moonlit, gothic, uh, it's also a, a searing tale of how love sometimes loves to lie and ruin, and it's recently been re-released re in several languages, including Spanish. She followed it up in 2004 with How to Disappear Completely, a brief and spooky novel about a haunted house in post-2001 Argentina when the economic crisis was severe and Matias, the protagonist, was living in a kind of state of ruin. In 2009, she began collecting the short stories she was writing and the dangers of smoking in bed, a collection full of missing children, of people giving themselves over to obsessions or becoming the obsessions of others. In one of them, a rocker receives a tribute that no one would want, and another, a despised beggar, torments a wealthy neighborhood. And yet another, published in the current issue of Freeman's, a woman develops a fetish for sick hearts and goes to great lengths to satisfy her curiosity. We're here because 22 years after she made her debut in Spanish, Things We Lost in the Fire, Enriquez's first collection published in English is published now. Uh, it's a haunting and terrifying collection of stories. They're stories of horror about everyday life in Argentina, when narco wars turn up headless bodies in well-known neighborhoods, when feminists light themselves on fire to protest, protest the conditions of women. It's impossible to read these stories and leave with dry eyes, let alone dry armpits. 
the and they also find the soft spot where fear meets something giving, um, and they push gently at first at that spot, and then harder. She's currently the deputy editor of the literary supplement of the newspaper Pagina. Pa Pagina. And she lives in Buenos Aires. So join me in welcoming Mariana Enriquez. Xiao Lu Guo was born in 1973 in, in China in a fishing village facing Taiwan, raised by her grandparents. She lived there until she was 18 years old when she went to Beijing Academy and studied film, a journey that she replicates in several of her books. There she fell in love with French New Wave films and Roland Barthes and began making films of her own. In 1998, she debuted with Love in the Internet Age. Apparently, it exists, and, it, and she began to write novels as well. I know, I'm just, I was going to start reading to that beat. <laughs> the first of these books was published in English. And it was called The Village of Stone. It begins with one of my favorite lines ever. It all started with a parcel of dried eel. Village of Stone is about a girl in silence and solitude and trying to overcome sexual abuse. It's a book about the loneliness that settles in when you go from one place to another and how that loneliness can settle inside a relationship when memory is not big enough to contain it. In her late 20s, Zhao Lu moved to Britain uh, on a British Council Fellowship for Film, and she started a novel based on that journey. It's called A Concise Chinese-English Dictionary for Lovers, and it's about a woman who comes from China to England and knows virtually no English. And over the course of the English uh, of, of the book, which is written as a series of journal entries, she learns the language, falls in love, and learns it a lot on the pillow, as they say. The book is full of wondrous and hilarious malapropisms of language. In the opening pages, the character says, I am alien, like Hollywood film alien. I live in another planet with funny looking and strange language. Among her other books are 20 Fragments of a Ravenous Youth, the tale of a woman's life alongside photographs which trace her journey from the pristine photo fields, potato fields of her youth to the edges of Beijing's growing film industry where she works as an extra. In 2009, Zhao Lu lived in Paris, and she wrote a novel in English called UFO in Her Eyes, which was later made into a film, all while studying French. It's a strange and funny, fragmentary novel about a woman in a small village who sees a flying saucer and causes a media storm. You see in Zhao Lu's books the, how loneliness in this world has a knock-on effect to the love lives that people have. Heartbreak is basically at the center of her work, and in her collection, lovers of, in the age of indifference, many of which are set in Brazil, Beijing, she conjures a world where matters of the heart can get you hurt. In 2013, she was named one of the best of young British novelists, the same year that she published her most ambitious novel to date, I Am China, which consists of made-up letters passed back and forth between two characters, which are then passed to a British publisher, and then passed again to a translator who tries to assemble them into the novel that you read. As you see, she's had a brilliant and itinerant life, the subject of which is now part of a new memoir called Once Upon a Time in the East, or Nine Continents, as it was published in America, the story of motherhood and mothering, about Zhao Lu's journey back to China and what she was missing from there, the last edges of her memory of that place beginning to recede. She once said, if I couldn't return to China, it would be the big failure of my life. She's been in Shanghai recently, so she's not a failure yet. Please join me in welcoming Zhao Lu Guo. And finally, Nadifa Muhammad was born in 1983 in Hergesa, the capital of the autonomous but not yet internationally recognized state of Somaliland. Her father was a merchant sailor, her mother a local landlady. At age four, her family emigrated to England for what they thought was a brief stay and turned into the rest of her life. Nadifa grew up in London and attended and graduated from Oxford University where she studied history and politics. Her debut novel, Black Mamba Boy, was published in 2010 and grew from a desire to know more about and tell parts of her father's epic journey across the Horn of Africa in the 1930s and 1940s when parts of it were under Mussolini's rule. It tells the odyssey of Jama, who travels across multiple borders from Djibouti to Egypt to Yemen in search of his own missing father. It won her a Betty Trask Award and a shortlisting on nearly a dozen other prizes. Imagine if Odysseus wasn't coming home from war, but was a child soldier, questing not for his long lost wife, but perhaps for a father. And you can imagine the power and the risk and the adventure in this tale. In 2013, Nadifa was also selected for one of British, Britain's best young novelist lists, their once a decade list, which, which has included talents such as David Mitchell, Hanif Qureshi, Julian Barnes, 
Ari Kunzru, Kamala Shamsi, Pat Barker, and recent Nobel laureate Kazuo Ishiguro. Based on the Orchard of Lost Souls in Adifa's second novel, uh, and the book, which is also here, as well as all of their other books, it doesn't feel hyperbolic to place Nadifa in this company. Set in the late 1980s in Hergesa, as the Somali dictatorship was beginning to crush the resistance there, Orchard of Lost Souls tells the tale of three very different women whose fates are inexplicably tied up in the restrictions they face as women in what is about to become a conflict zone. Filson is a soldier from Mogadishu who has been sent to Hergesa to keep order. Kausar is a well-to-do widow in her 1950s who has an orchard built upon the, de the graves of buried children. Deco was born in a refugee camp and is living in the gaps between official and unofficial life. Cycling between these stories, Muhammad presents a prismatic view of the costs of violence through the generations of lives of women, how when the heat is enough, borders between their classes break down. Please join me in honking your horn and clapping for all of them. I apologize for that extra long introduction, but I feel like given the conversation I'd like to have with these writers, some context of their work and where they come from is necessary. So I'm gonna start in reverse order of distance traveled. Um, Nadifa, you've come all the way from the Eurostar. Um, I, all the, uh, two of these three writers have given talks today at NYU, um, and we were talking around the issue of history, but I wonder if we can talk a little bit more directly about history and the role you think it can play in, no in novel writing. Um, what is the difference, you studied history, between a historical document, between narrative history, like the history you read in university, and the way that a novel, like your own, your two books, can tell history, and what, it, what, what does it make possible? I think, can you hear me? I think the line is pretty fine and generally blurred, so my interest in stories, nar uh, narratives, comes from, I think, my study of history, and I studied British history, European history, rather than anything close to my own family's background. But there were a few um, moments where I think something cut through that time, that's time and space, and I could feel what that person um, must have felt or experienced. Um, just to give you an example, I was studying the Reformation in, the, in, the, in England, in, in Britain, in the 16th century. And there was a woman, an elderly woman, who couldn't read, and she saved up enough money to be able to buy an, a Bible in English, which was a capital crime under um, Queen Mary. And for that, she was um, sentenced to death. And that whole narrative, that, that brief narrative, was, I think, enough to engage my brain. And it was always, I was always seeking out those small stories, those individual stories. And that brought alive my interest in history generally. I think we generally think of history as a study of top-down power structures. But for me, it was always um, those individual stories caught up within these bigger forces that captured my imagination. And when it came to writing my father's life story as a novel, it was the fact that he he was experiencing um, colonialism, war, um, poverty, dispossession as a small boy, not understanding the political and economic aspects of it, but feeling it, seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that sometimes we, we ignore that when we're studying history. We see it almost as if it's a, a natural progression from one, one stage to another stage. But for the people caught up in it, it's not. And my gut feeling is that actually history is much more chaotic than that and not reliable. So that cleaned up narrative that we get through universities, through um, official research, excludes a lot. And that's where novels can actually enter the, the slipstream and, and add to that. I want to ask you a follow-up question. <laughs> <laughs> um, the follow-up question is, how many people think that guy's a douchebag? <laughs> um, my follow-up question is, uh, you, we talked uh, er, last week when we were in Sarajevo together, and you were mentioning that you were talking to your father about the journeys that he had. He's imprisoned in Egypt and, and deported to Yemen, um, which is uh, to now... To Palestine. To Palestine, which um, n now is an almost inconceivable journey for a child. Uh, but as he told these stories to you, he told you what happened in what order, but he didn't tell you how he felt. Do you think that was a generational thing? Was it a survival technique? Um, and at, 
how did you find uh, the ability to imagine the psychological state of someone who was uh, repeatedly brutalized and uh, and dispossessed? Right. So yes. Um, as you said, he didn't remember often the psychological space that he was in. He, he remembered the bus routes, he remembered the factual details of his life at that time in great, great detail. But when I asked him, well, who were your friends? Or what did you think about, what did you feel? That was absent from his narrative. So that's where it became a novel rather than it being a biography or a history book. And I think that was a function of trauma, that you can only get through certain things by not reflecting on them too much. And also, yes, generational. People were not encouraged to, to think about themselves. They were always kind of discouraged from feeling self-pity, that you have to be strong, you have to put your faith in God and just get on with it. So it was a mixture of both of those things. But as my dad was nearing his 80s, I think he was learning, as, the, as British culture was also changing and becoming more open, he was also picking up these ideas of, you know, expressing love and expressing weakness and expressing regret. All of these things which had probably been very much contained within him up until that point. And it's really funny, but I, I could see a change in him from watching Ricky Lake. <laughs> <laughs> So he would watch Ricky Lake and see all these people emoting, emoting, emoting. And that made him reflect on his past experiences because often what they were saying was nothing in comparison to what he experienced, but there was so much emotion around it. So that's when he started telling me with words that he loved me. And it's, uh, it's really interesting that it could be something like Ricky Lake that could affect that change. Oh, God, I just want to have a little moment. To re <laughs> that's, that's really sweet. Um, Mariana, today you, you gave a really, a, a quite a brilliant talk about um, why you write in the horror and science fiction and fantasy genres, how that's different from Argentinian writers, um, basically, uh, since 1950 on, and how after Borges, there was a, a, a polemical desire to only write factually and actually, uh, and, and to treat the imagination as a luxury. Um, and reading your stories uh, and, and novels, one of the things that, that comes up again and again in the way that history is reflected in the body and the way that uh, characters embody history in different ways. And I wonder if you can speak a little bit about uh, how history is written onto the body your, of your characters and how you uh, chart that, if, if you plan it or if it happens and then it's simply a symptom of the symbol it's, it's reflecting. I think it happens, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Thank you for coming. Um, I think it happens because the theme of the body in contemporary Argentinian history is totally central because my generation, I'm 44, I was born two years before the latest dictatorship. And the main thing that happened in that di di dictatorship is that they took bodies. I mean, there's no dead people. People were kidnapped and disappeared. So the absence of the bodies, when I was young, um, when I was a child, and afterwards, I think made me obsessed with the body. Made me obsessed with that presence. I wanted that presence. And it was very present in a way. I mean, if you go to any human rights demonstration in Argentina, in Argentina we demonstrate all the time, like, this is totally normal. This is day in Argentina. It's not a fine World Cup final. This is, you know, uh, inflation. <laughs> and <laughs> so, if you go to a human rights demonstration, all the mothers are, the mothers of the disappeared are with the faces of their children that will never come back. And they're very young. They're much younger than me. So these are ghosts of bodies that will never appear. And somehow they are appearing now because some of them are being uh, identified as bones in uh, common graves around the city. So this idea of a body that is no longer there, is not going to be there, but people, for a political reason, need to ask about this body because, you know, to prove a crime, you have to have the body. So all this complexity of uh, something fa phantasmagoric and yet as uh, you know material as a body that is absent is something that I can't 
even if I, uh, if, even if some, sometimes I want to, because it's like, again, this obsession with the body that is gone. I mean, sometimes I get very bored about what I do. And um, <laughs> I want to try like different angles and stuff. And suddenly I'm writing a short story and then there's a child that is gone. I said, no, come back. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it doesn't. And, and I have to understand that that is written in my body too. Mm. This was the first thing that I experienced fear with. And fear is a very physical feeling. And... Uh, this is a fear that is also in history. So it's something that even when I'm not planning to put there, it appears there, it's there, and it's part of my history and my personal history because I was thinking something that she said. To me, history is very personal. I can't, um, I always lived in Argentina, I always lived in Buenos Aires, and, Buenos, and Argentina is um, a, city, uh, a country that repeats itself. Like every 10 years, we have an economic crisis. Every t- I mean, it's, it's a very, it's very sci-fi that way. It's like time, you know? It's a point in time that we always come back to, uh, but it's always worse. And um, <laughs> so, I, and this is my history. This is my personal history. I can never see it as something, you know, from a textbook. This all is, and, and it's very physical in a way that, um, if you have like a mega inflation like we used to have in the 80s and milk is one peso in the morning and it's 10 pesos in the afternoon I'm not making this up this is this happened exactly like that and maybe even more this is this is everyday history that changes the way you eat that changes the way your mother feels in the morning she's happy because she has one peso in the afternoon she's totally upset because she doesn't have 10 and uh so she spends the money on that and cigarettes. <laughs> 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 so history it, it is kind of very, very present because to me, uh, it has nothing abstract to it. And when there's nothing abstract to it, it's totally physical, totally related to the body. There's no way I can help to think that way. Yeah. And some of the stories, there's a story in uh, Things We Lost in the Fire where a woman suffering from anorexia becomes obsessed and falls in love with a skull. Yeah. Um, and, and the story that uh, is in the new issue of Freeman's, the woman is obsessed with recording uh, erratic heartbeats and falls in love with an older man who's with a bad heart, and then she gives him lots of cocaine to make his heart worse. Yeah. And then she listens to his heart as they have sex. Yeah, I took um, that from the internet, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the sick people there. <laughs> No judgments. Uh, <laughs> but I, I wonder if you can talk a tiny bit about um, self-harm in the context of that kind of history, because in many ways, self-harm is a way to control um, the, 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 the sort of chimneying of anxieties and, um, and, and history within you uh, to, to externalize it. You know? And I, it's, do, do, you, do you find that um, uh, mm. That, that that kind of um, relationship keeps coming up in your stories, or am I just reading into it too much? I I, I think on the contrary, it's like um, I, I I see I can see how you could read it as a control, but to me, is um, the body totally out of control? Is the body like um, you know uh, lost? in the obsessions, unable to control the obsessions, unable to to stop harming itself in a way mirroring history, not trying to control it, but you know, totally diving into it. Because it can't do anything else. Mm. Because if in a way um, in a way there's only hurt. Yeah. Uh, I'm very depressed now. <laughs> but, um, but 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 it's something like that, and um, and I also find obsession quite uh, erotic in in a way, and um, so uh, especially in in those in those two stories, I I chose to put women also in in situations where a female narr- narrator is not usually positioned like the woman that falls in love with a 
with this guy is a predator, basically. And um, and the woman that uh, this, the falls in love with the skull is a woman that doesn't want uh, any kind of recovery, that finds a lot of power in in becoming an, a skeleton, basically. Mm. So I tried, it in a way, to get out of the narrat of the usual narrative of, of uh, you know somehow uh, the romantic thing. Uh, the woman in the heart story is not romantic. She's totally. She knows what she wants, and she's going to open you up if she has to. And uh, and the other woman is very far from any medical discourse or recovery discourse. On the contrary, she really enjoys being insane. So um, I, I wanted to play a, li a little with that. I think mm. I think they're funny <laughs> stories. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you guys didn't see the eye contact when she was like, she will open you up. <laughs> uh, um, I, I want to ask Jalou a question, um, partly because I'm sweating now. I have um, one. It, you know, one of the, I think, the worries about writing of history is to reinscribe the imbalances and injustices of, of history, even when you think you're writing against it. And Jalou, I, I think a lot of your novel, UFO of Her Eyes, which, um, amongst other things, it's a kind of hybrid text has spliced in there dialogues uh, of the um, uh, the spies who are eavesdropping on phone calls and things. Um, and and instead of being in control and instead of being um, powerful, they're, they're kind of idiots. And I, I wonder if you can talk a little <laughs> bit about um, y you know your work as a documentary filmmaker and as a novelist and where they overlap and how you can use forms uh, that come with the, the envelope of factuality or truth to subvert the ways that history is mm. written uh, mm. publicly, especially in a place like China. I love you use that word, uh, idiot. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a great word because really what I try to do, idiotic view on very heavy history, which China has had and still, <clears throat> And also, I guess my personal history as kind of immigrant, I really see myself as immigrant. Can a nihilistic person write about a very he heavy history? You know, and how do you write about if you try to be amoralistic or non ideological? I guess this is the question I really have, you know, f from the beginning of my writing life since I was 13 or 14. When you grow up in a country like China or Russia, very political, very ideological, and also so moralistic, it seems like the only way to get out is be completely nihilistic. And of course, you're pretending to be nihilistic. And I think my way of writing, I just laugh about, I try to laugh about all these correct or self righteous characters, you know, like the novel you mentioned. And I find that maybe that's the only way to get out been judged, you're just pretending you to be, you, you are happy, you know, and I think one of the early maybe inspirations in the 1980s when I was becoming a teenager, China suddenly opened up from the Cultural Revolution, so all the books from the West was banned and banned during the Cultural Revolution, so I grew up from the zero culture, and then suddenly 1980s, all the Western literature translated were allowed to read, and that was a moment I think I discovered a certain kind of maybe ontological anxiety, which is a vocabulary never existed in my culture before 1970s. Ontological? Do we have that issue, <laughs> you know? And I think first books we, we are allowed to read, really, Allen Ginsberg, How, B Generation, and I remember like Frank O'Hara, uh, worked very well in, in China in the 80s because it was easier to access, you know, those sentences are so lack of history in a way, you know, in the B generation, it was kind of lack of this heavy past and uh, for, for my generation, try to be nihilistic, we easily accepted that narrative and I think that's the beginning of my, oh, just gonna breathe, you know, breathe from this heavy Confucius and yet become communist, you know, that kind of narrative. Um, yeah, that sounds your question. Yeah, no, um, because your 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 first film was Love in the Internet Age, um, and then there was a film called Concrete uh, Revolution. Concrete Revolution, which is about the <laughs> the douchebags are a dime a dozen these <laughs> days. <laughs> uh, we don't need to repeat that. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, Concrete Revolution was about the build up to the the Beijing Olympics. 
um, was it Beijing? Yeah, was, yeah. exactly. Um, yes. And so you were making these hyper contemporary films, but uh, the first novel, um, and I know it wasn't your first, but the first pu- translated into English, Village of Stone, goes back to the village you're writing about in this memoir. Um, and it's sort of a two track book. One track is. A, a young girl growing up in this village raised by her grandparents. She undergoes a, a terrible trauma. Simultaneously, she's living in a Beijing which has no history, and she's trying to, to braid those, those, rea- those realities together. Having had a rural communist childhood that has a trauma and then having a present which has, you know, has n- nothing to grab onto. And I, I wonder if you feel over the course of... That, w- that book is almost 20 years old now if you find that you have to put both of those things in one book, if that makes any sense. No, I I think one thing is like, I, I, I don't really want to write about personal history. So personal history is ex- extremely important, the foundation of all my writing and the filmmaking, but I really want to have a collective history, collective memory, because I guess, you know, it's to do with growing up in China in a, in a place private history is not allowed or is not encouraged to be celebrated. So this, this, this genre in the West called memoir, we don't have that kind of genre. If you call your book memoir, you are so pompous, you know. So you are kind of, it's kind of a negative thing. And I, I guess I, you know, there's something I, against that culture, but also I do contain certain moral value and a judgment from my old culture. So I refuse to only write about the, the life around me. And I kind of adore, you know, the 60s, 50s left bank French intellectuals who were able to comment on the public life or collective life in that generation. So I wanted to become one of those <laughs> kind of intellectuals. And that's how I began to make film. I thought, at least to make film, I have to use 10, 20, 100 people so they might not represent my voice. And they can be them, not just me. And I just, you know, this is weird, strange self uh, limitation and I don't want to hear myself all the time is so you know self-obsessed you know so I'm against a writer's nature to struggle to get a social voice and I sounds very Chinese or Korean or North Korean in a way you know I just uh, it's just the, the, the way how I div- you know divide my my writing life and the filmmaking life mm. um. Nadifa, uh, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, last, last year, Jalu was in Sarajevo for the festival that you just returned from. Jalu, you grew up in a communist country. Um, Nadifa, you grew up in a country which had a civil war. And the two of us went to the Srebrenica exhibit. Um, and tomorrow will be the uh, 23rd anniversary of a genocide of 8,000 Muslims in Sarajevo, um, outside of Sarajevo during that war. Um, it, it occurred right next to a UN safe area, um, which was declared by the Dutch. Uh, They kicked 3,200 people out of um, a a safe area, and they were taken to their deaths. Um, And when we were sitting in there, you were commenting about how contemporaneous this was to the civil war in Somalia, um, how similar some of the techniques and divisive language was. And I wonder, since we're talking about history, and y- your novels are very specifically about Somali history, those first two, not your third. Um, what does it mean when you experience something that's laterally so similar? Uh, what does it make possible, I guess, for, in your imagination? Yes, it was, it was really disturbing. And it's hard for me to get disturbed because I feel like I've had so much intake of disturbing material that it's unusual for anything to actually get under my skin. But it was a, a small exhibition um, with photography, um, images of the, the process of identify, identifying people and reburying people from these mass graves. And also there were, at the beginning of the exhibition, there was just a list of names. And just glancing at them, you could see that sometimes 150 people had the same surname. So I guess they were related or 100, 200 people. So just whole communities wiped out. And Something about Sarajevo that I noticed immediately was that its wounds are very visible. There are still mortar, mortar scars on buildings, and in, and they have these roses on the ground which mark where there were big um, explosions during the civil war. And in Hargeisa, my hometown, there's none of that. It was obliterated during the civil war, but then rebuilt as if nothing had happened and everything is kind of that plasticky, shiny Dubai, <laughs> Dubai mirrored um, architecture. 
So it was, it was confronting for me to go to a city which wore its scars so obviously and almost kind of aggressively because the, the Somali or Somaliland way of doing it has been to pretend nothing has happened really. So there are no obvious cemeteries to the people who died in the war. There's no exhibitions. There's a couple of memorials in the city, but they're vague. You know, there's a, a captured army um, MiG helicopter sat on a plinth in the center of one part of town. But it's, it's just been almost wiped away as a memory. And I, when I'm researching, when I'm w working on my novels, I, I'm trying to s scrub away that, that dust and that, that, that forgetful, um, dust I guess it feels like dust and I spoke to a guy who was a psychiatrist he'd retrained he was actually an obstetrician and he'd worked in the hospital where I was born but when the war broke out he was told to go to, the hospital was requisitioned for the army and he was forced to work 12 days in a row until he finally managed to escape and he went away trying to find his family because the whole city had been emptied of people and eventually made his way to Canada, suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, and then retrained as a psychiatrist. And now he was one of the very few psychiatrists in the country, and he would visit for a month, giving free treatment every, every summer. And there are high levels of mental health issues, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, the, everything. A huge amount of people suffer from it, to the point where my family home is rented out by a, a psychosocial unit, which charges people to basically keep their their mentally ill relatives in quite dungeon-like conditions. So you see that level of trauma, but then I think if you try and broach it too, too clearly, as, as they were doing in Sarajevo, there's, there's a community blowback, and sometimes a political blowback, where you're not meant to talk about the Civil War because X did Y and Z did um, this, so you can't, you can't start to untangle who did what. So it's just been a, a collective act of amnesia, I think, to get through that. Is that part of why you wrote The Orchard of Lost Souls? Yes, because I shared in the amnesia. I also didn't really understand what happened during the war. I was in England, I was young, so those are my excuses. But there were also... I had hints of what happened. So one of the characters in The Orchard of Lost Souls is an older woman who's abandoned in her bed because she can't walk. And that happened to my grandmother. She was in her 70s, 80s, and we'd left her with care, but literally within the first few days of the Civil War, everyone fled the city. So people like my grandmother who couldn't walk, couldn't fend for themselves, were left behind. And in her instance, she was saved. She was saved by a relative, but I know of other people who were not saved and who died in those circumstances. Mm. So I hadn't really thought about this seriously as a, as a, as a relative or as a writer. So the, that novel was my way of thinking about it, actually sitting with it and saying, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to sit in your bed or lie in your bed without water and expect a mortar to come through at any point and kill you? in a city that you've lived all your life and expected to die peacefully. What does it mean? Mm. Mariana, I want to uh, ask you a question. Um, what Nadeev just, just described is a weaponized um, intimate space so that your home can be dangerous. Um, your home can be occupied. Uh, I live with someone who left Lebanon during the Civil War and we went back and the general who took the house from her family was still living in it. Mm. They didn't pay, he didn't pay for it. We had tea with this guy. They, he said, thank you very much, and we went on our way. Um, and that, that, to them, to Lebanese uh, people, was completely normal. And I was like, but where's the deed to your house? And she said, it doesn't work that way in war. And um, one of the things that, you, that, currently, that, that occurs and recurs in your stories are haunted houses. Yeah. Uh, some of them are simply just haunted, but some of them are haunted by because they were torture areas. And I wonder if you can talk about uh, the artistic element of that, but also connected a little bit to what people here may not know, which is that um, everyday houses were also used for detainment centers. Yeah. Well, we are, first in, in Buenos Aires, it's, um, it's a bit like Sarajevo. We are, I think we are the world capital of memory. We have, uh, yeah, we have memorials everywhere. And, um, we have uh, in the street, for example, you can walk here and there's a place that says, I don't know, Jose Miguel Suarez was taken from here in 1960, 1976. 
and uh, he was uh, working here. It's a constant reminder in all the city of what happens. There's um, there's this uh, little uh, you don't even know. Like you you look around and there's a face. They say, "Who is it?" And there's a dead person. You're surrounded by it. And um, what happened in the city is that since the, the dictatorship was very the last one because there were many. But the last one that the w was the most violent one was at the same time very secretive. So it didn't really have official places for uh, political prisoners. First, there were no political prisoners. There's a famous interview with the de facto president once that they asked him about these people that were being taken and he says, well, but if they don't exist, if they, they disappear, they don't exist. And he, he makes a gesture that is very spooky, and he, he says, they disappear, they're gone, they don't exist. And it's like, wow. And, um, but they did exist. And they were all, not only through Buenos Aires, but all through the country, some in detention centers that were like uh, police uh, places, for example, or military places, but others were schools, um, many were uh, places where they sold uh, uh, the cars, for example. Uh, mm, uh, some were just random houses that w they were used for for some reason, and these were secret places that. Basically, I was telling today, uh, there were people were tortured there, and the way of them for the neighbors not to listen was to put the the radio very loud, so they didn't hear the screams. Now, there's something about this that always disturbed me in the way that I didn't, I never um, believed people. That said, I do, I didn't know what was happening in the in the car rental house next door. I think they knew. They were scared. So, because of trauma, many years later, they refused to acknowledge that they knew, and they preferred to know they didn't know, which I I really don't believe. There's a very interesting documentary of a, a guy made that he goes to all the neighbors of these places. And it's amazing because nobody recognizes. They said, oh, no, we didn't know. We went home. Yeah, people were coming and going. And then slowly they are telling terrible things. But no, we thought it was the television. It's amazing. And he goes through many of them. So the idea, I really like to write horror as in horror. I really like a story that scares you and it has kind of the icons of horror. The thing is that I like uh, stories about haunted houses, but the thing is they are haunted by what? So this is a city that has a lot of haunted places, let's say. Because they also, the other thing that they did is that they used the place and they, f for example, they closed the place, they tore the place down, the place didn't exist anymore. This all like phantasmagoric points in the city helped me to, you know, uh, in a way, revisit the idea of the haunted house with history. Mm. But still, it's a haunted house, it's ghosts. Uh, the thing is not a ghost of a woman in black. Uh, it, it's a ghost of something else. And, um, yeah. The big, big, big uh, concentration camp that is called the um, ESMA. ESMA is um, Escuela School of uh, Mechanical of the Arm of the Navy. The Navy were, of the three forces, they were the most savage of the three. And uh, if you go and talk to the guards, it's amazing because they don't want to talk about it. But if you talk a bit, they say, no, but at night. And they start telling you stories of this girl that passes, of this and that. And uh, the place has a very weird thing that it has trees that when you cut them for some reason, what do you call like the... The, 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 the sap. Yeah, it's red. So you go there and they're cutting it and all the trees are bleeding. <laughs> and this is like, what is this 
what is going on? How can you be so literal? Mm. And, you know, to, to go there and not see it as a very... And also, when the military left, they took all the, um, the heating, so it's very cold. It's very much like a haunted house with trees that are bleeding, screams on peak. Uh, like trees are bleeding and it's very cold. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, and at the same time, it's kind of difficult to write, like, a, like uh, to, to use this history that st is still happening to people in a story. Uh, in a story that way, in a story that is also uh, considered entertainment and things like that. So, so yeah, that. Uh, Xiao Lu, um, after what you just said about memoir and not wanting to write about oneself and or be pompous, um, your last book is a memoir. Um, uh, it's not called "I Am China." It's it's uh, nine continents, and you you've you've talked to me um, and you write in the book about the fact that you wrote this because you were beginning to lose the memories of the place, um, and also there was that one brief period when you were a mother and your mother was alive and I wonder if given what Mariana just said ab about reclaiming spaces which are haunted um, you know was was that aspect any reason why um, you went against you know the disinclinations of, of yourself and Chinese literary culture to write a, to write a memoir or broaden it from there uh, well, that's quite a <laughs> very deep question. I'm going to have a very superficial answer because uh, I'm going to give a quick one, I guess. Um, I, I, I think it's very interesting what you said is a whole reflective uh, work we are doing as a writer to confront a concealed past, a painful past, is a work of facing the pain and unspoken truth, yeah? In the, it, Maybe people try to bury or they deliberately bury or, or, or just uh, try to bury without reason. But I think we are mad as a writer. Someone won or lost. <laughs> France, whatever, lose or win. <laughs> we find out in, in a few minutes. Um, oh, wow. Is it? Is it? It's a goal. Okay. Okay, so I think for me it's a distance between the, the direct reflection in my original language and the writing it intellectually in my second language in English, but also engaged with the intellectual language. I think that is a thing I try to deal with in this so-called memoir, you know, because I started writing Chinese when I was young, so I did wrote 10 books in Chinese, and all my life was in China before. And this big switch, which made me lost of my reflective ability in what language as a writer. You know, it's like Roland, Roland Butter said, language is skin, you wear one skin to live. But I thought, really, well, what the skin I wear or which skin I, it's like a caterpillar or, or a snake. You have to get rid of the old skin, painfully coming out from a new skin from soft, you know, the current pain and that become a rough skin again. And I, I think I'm just in this shadowy space from a direct reflection with my natural language and this almost unnatural intellectual reflection you know, through alien language, which I'm speaking now in English. Um, this is my difficulty, really. Mm. Um, I, I want to ask Mariana the same question, but um, you know, wh what did your family make of this book? Uh, because in some ways, they were the clearly characters in it. And y you know, two answers ago, you discussed the uh, you know the disinclination to, be, to to externalize your private life, at least within the China Chinese culture that you come from. And suddenly, uh, you know, I assume yeah. you asked them, but absolutely. And I also, it's a good question because I, uh, in a lot of uh, occasion, I felt like I'm uh, making enemies with my, with the writer's world or largely, let's say, Western world. Why I'm doing that? Because I felt <laughs> the, the natural expression and uh, a, you know, a certain a certain literary tradition in me was completely suppressed, and has been suppressed until any moment, like now. You know, I, and also when you change language to write. I discovered I'm merely writing fiction, yet I was not a fiction writer in Chinese language. I wrote prose. And after 15 years living in Europe, I felt this 
something, something painful in my skin. And I found this form, Prozessi again. So I wrote Nine Continents, yeah, this, this new book. But we call it Memoir, anyway. It, it was so fast, that book. You know, so with other books I wrote in English, they are fiction. And I, I was unable to deal with this, this Western idea of fiction because the Chinese fiction, you know it, you know, from reading Ha Jing or that. They, they're quite elusive. They, they are really prose poetry, long poems. And in my situation, I, I was not able to do a certain kind of Western narrative so naturally. And I, maybe I don't need to do it. But when you use different languages, the language control me rather than I control the language. The language become a certain identity which swept me away from my old identity. I was unable to control my narrative. And that's how I felt. So I'm, I'm merely suggesting how this new language changed the way I wrote, write. Mm. And with memoirs, suddenly I found a more natural form. It's this fragmentary essay make up the book. Yeah. Um, Adam, uh, we're, we're going to go to questions very shortly, but I want to ask each of them to read very briefly from the issue, which um, none of us have up here. So while I tap dance um, into a question with Nadifa, um, I, I, if you could get, get one. Nadifa, this is the first uh, character um, in some ways that you've written about. Filson, Deco, and Kaswar Karswa, are... Um, Kassar are all um, kind of drawn from your mother, as you say, but not her. No, definitely not her. Yeah. Um, and I wonder um, how, how, how you feel um, reading against sirens. Um, no, how do you, how do you, is there an extra level of self-consciousness when you're taking someone who did exist, who isn't family, um, and, and sort of prying open his life? Yes, yeah, so John is referring to my third novel, which I've just kind of finished. And it's set um, in 1950s Cardiff, and it's about a Somali sailor that my father knew who was um, accused of a murder. And he was, a, he was a man that I've basically been kind of hunting down for about 10 years, constantly kind of keeping tabs on, um, but only in the last two years that I sit down and start writing about him. And in the process, I've met his granddaughter and I've met people that knew him. And I've got a sense of him, which I think is very strong and very um, particular. So in the same way that when I was writing, in a different way to how I was writing about my father, I've now been able to write about Mahmoud with, a much, with much greater freedom. Um, he was a rebel and he was someone who wasn't interested in um, convention. So that's allowed me to actually examine him and his choices and his psychology with much more freedom than I was able to examine my father's or my, my mother's, even though my mother wasn't really a character in my work. So um, I think my responsibility that I, I do believe I have still is to his descendants who have had hard lives. You know, his loss created this kind of echoing effect throughout their lives, through their father's lives and now their lives which is uh, you know, a sign of trauma. And I have to be careful because I, I don't want to write something that will cause them more trauma. And it's similar with the victim's family as well. I've met the niece and she's asked me to change the names, even though they're easily obtainable online. He, um, you should say um, that he was convicted uh, of a crime he didn't commit and the crime was to murder a shopkeeper. A Jewish shopkeeper. Yes, in 1952. And the, the niece, who's still alive, was in the next room when her aunt was killed and was one of the witnesses in the, in the case as well. And she said that at the age of 10, after this murder, all of her childhood memories went away. And she feels as if she's been cursed. She's lost everyone close to her throughout her life. And, you know, she wasn't able to reflect and she ran away from Cardiff and then has now returned as an, as an elderly woman. And she asked me to change their names. And I thought, what, what does it cost me to do that? It's a creative decision, but it's also, a, you know, it's a way of paying back a family that I'm also, uh, you know, whose story I am taking. Mm. Do you want to read a little bit of the stolen story? Yes. <laughs> okay, so... Red brick and leaded glass. The smell of bleach and defeat. The employment exchange has the atmosphere of a church. Job notices flutter from the walls like paper prayers. And council workers dole out state relief with the aloofness of, pr of priests placing wafers into indigent mouths. 
Out of work miners, dock workers, drivers, handymen, barrel boys, plumbers and factory workers mill around, avoiding each other's eyes. The pinewood floor is dented by the tramp of work boots near the counter and littered with cigarette butts and matches. Welder needed. 10 years experience necessary. Under 21 years, apprenticeships. Carpenters needed, grave digging. Mahmoud shoves his hands into his sports jacket and paces from one notice to another, looking for boiler or foundry work. He has only shrapnel in his pocket, having lost the rest at poker. There is nothing worth trying for. None of the usual firms that can be relied upon to take colored, fe colored fellas are advertising. He looks again at the grave digging notice. It's for Western Cemetery, the pay not half bad, but the thought of shoveling hard, damp earth and filling it with stiff corpses makes him shake his head and mutter, Astaghfirullah. Pulling his chilby hat low over his eyebrows, he takes a yellow ticket stamped nine and waits his turn at the counter, standing beside one of the heavy coiled radiators. The heat from the cast iron blasts through his thin trousers and teases his skin, somewhere between pleasure and pain. And he rocks his body back and forth, letting the heat rise and dissipate. On the last tramper he had taken, the owners had installed new boilers and all the brass fittings had shone gold in the white light of the furnaces. He had stepped back to admire the conflagration before shoveling more coal in and turning the white light into an almost sentient, colorless gas that roved backwards and up the chimney like a genie escaping a lamp. He had birthed that fire and nurtured it from yellow to orange to white to blue, and then that color that had no name, just pure energy. He'd wondered what it would be like to step forward the few inches that separated him from it whether his skin would just fall from his flesh like a sheet. He had been formed by those fires, turned from a puny pantry boy into a knotted muscled stoker who could stand at Hell's Gate for hours at a stretch, face roasted and grimy with coal dust. I don't know that there's any possible segue between that and um, a, a woman who's obsessed with heartbeats. Um, yeah, but I, I, I wonder if there's a, <laughs> th there's a way that you can, you can read. I have, I have palpitations. You have palp... Oh, okay. Um. <laughs> you guys can uh, talk afterwards, I guess. <laughs> no. Um, really, this story is like... Um, something that we talked a lot about history and a, a, a lot about uh, how history uh, you know it's um, everyday life etc et but I'm also very interested in what we do when we are alone and uh, mostly what we do when we are alone is go in the internet <laughs> and um, for some reason, at one point in my life, I was looking for weird sex fetishes. And, uh, <laughs> and they were very obvious ones, but this was not obvious. And, um, and they were doing live sessions of... Um, <laughs> Of heartbeats, I don't know. And um, oh, please finish that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were, and they were doing that, and they were chats, and they were like, uh, "Baby, go higher," and things like that. I was like, oh, "Wow!" And my mother is a doctor. And I, I don't know, I, I have, I, all things anatomical, medical, sound a bit pornographic to me. <laughs> there's a language there and there's a relation to the body that to me is uh, pornographic, not erotic. Uh, so this is a pornographic story. <laughs> and it starts like this. I have three memories. Uh, the title is Where Are You, Sweetheart? That is basically a line in a bolero. I have three memories of him, but one might be false. The order is arbitrary. 
In the first, he's sitting on a sofa, completely naked, on a towel, watching TV. He doesn't pay attention to me. I think I'm spying on him. His penis rests in a bush of black pubic hair, and the scar that runs through the hair of his chest is a dark pink. In the second, his wife leads him into the bedroom by the hand. He's also naked. He looks at me from the corner of his eye. His hair, his hair is very pretty long, even for the times, the 70s, and I can't see his scar. In the third, he's smiling at me from close up, his face almost glued to mine. In the memory, I feel myself naked and shy, but I don't know if it's real. It doesn't have the same naturalness as the others. I may have invented it, although I recognize the sensation of shyness and vulnerability that is often repeated in my dreams. I don't know if he touched me. The feeling that accompanies this memory resembles desire, although if my suspicions are correct, it should be more akin to horror. I'm not afraid of him. His face doesn't torment me, even though I try to make myself feel something like childhood trauma and its effects on my adult life. I was five when I met him. He was very sick. They had operated on his heart and the surgery had gone wrong. I found that out later when I stopped visiting his house. Really, the house of my friends, his daughters. I, when I, f I found it, uh, his daughters. I found out when he died, I don't remember what his name was and I never dared to ask my parents. A while after his death, I began to use my fingernails to score my chest, right in the middle, imitating his scar. I would do it before going to sleep, naked, and I would lift my head to see the line of irritated skin until it faded and my neck hurt. Well, and then she goes obsessed with this man until, you know, trying to find him. Ah, <laughs> oh, you have one. Should I do it? John? Yeah, I have no segue at all. <laughs> 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 I'm afraid I, this section is only about how to eat fish, so, but hopefully as exciting as internet or sex, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Depends how you see the fish, yeah. <coughs> so this is just set in a half century ago from uh, my essay called The Fisherman Always Eat Fish Eyes First. Make sure you fi eat fish eyes first. And it's about my grandparents <coughs> when they were yeah, when they were still young. I was told that already in their first year of marriage, my grandfather had decided to despise my grandmother. For example, he despised her for not knowing how to eat a fish properly in the fisherman's house in Shitan, in our village. When the fish was being served, the wife would first pick the fish eyes out for her husband with her chopsticks. And eating fish eyes would make a fisherman's eye bright, and he would not miss a single fish in the sea. But my grandmother didn't know that custom. She had barely cooked a fish in her inland mountain village. So I was told by the villagers that he shouted at her during that meal. And he said, stupid woman, don't you know fishermen always eat fish eyes first? And then after eating the fish eyes, According to our tradition, we would start from the fish tail. Eating the fish head straight away was considered bad luck for a fisherman. I'm against uh, something more important, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but still fish. But my grandmother thought to show her modesty by choosing the part that her husband was not eating. So she ate the fish head. She sucked the bones slowly. He grew so furious that he left the dining table immediately. Perhaps that explained why my grandfather always had such bad luck with his boat. And his boat was constantly ravaged by the typhoons all those years. Although my grandmother tried hard to learn all the customs of Shitang, but like all women in that area, she never set foot on her husband's boat or on any boat. To have a woman on your boat brings bad luck. Even though my grandmother sold fishing nets, fishing nets for my grandmother, but it was too late. 
She never won his heart. Thanks. You've been an amazingly focused audience, given the uh, distractions. Um, I wanted to talk about history because these are three different ways of, of holding um, things that history often doesn't present to us, whether it's the intimate life of a family in China or the life of a man erased by the criminal justice system um, for a crime he didn't commit, or the traumas that are living inside the bodies of people in a society which showed a great deal of disrespect to bodies, let alone citizens. Um, so forgive the overarching concern, but the biggest thing I want you to take away from the, is that these are three beautiful and vital writers. Their books are here. Um, Nadifa and Mariana's uh, pieces are in the current issue of Freeman's. Zhao Lu's, what she just read is from the previous issue, but that w became a book, Nine Continents. They're all inside. Um, we're going to have a quick Q&A, um, and then we can out-shout um, anyone on the street uh, about history rather than soccer. Um, does anybody have a question for any one of them? Yes. Hi. Um, this question is uh, for Nadifa, but also for, for all of you. Um, uh, you mentioned briefly um, uh, about deciding to uh, uh, not be an academic historian and instead be a novelist because you wanted to explore the m emotional lives of your, your subjects. Um, how did you make that decision? And, and do you feel that, uh, do you feel if there's a place in the academy uh, for uh, a, a more in-depth historical um, exploration of people and of emotions and a, a, of small stories that you talked about? Yes, um, I didn't want to make it sound as if that decision was very neat or linear because I left university really not wanting to study anything, so there was no way that I was going to become an academic. But um, I don't think it was a coincidence that I did my very first interview with my father while I was still at university. So I think something was going on in my mind without me realizing. And it took um, me leaving university, me not having anything to do for a while, and then finding work with a film company to start sort of framing real life experiences or important stories in a fictional way or in a filmic way. And it was that experience that led me to going back to my father and asking him actually about Mahmoud Matan's case. That was the very first story I wanted to enter. Um, and while the, my, I guess you, you're following your instincts and your, my instincts when writing about my father's story was to make sure that I knew the history behind it, the historiography, which wasn't great. You know, there's not much writing about 1930s, 40s Somali or East Africa. And if it is, it's from a colonial perspective, which is not what my father's experiences were um, like. So I think there are people who are doing history from all sorts of levels, you know, social history and um, the history of revolutions and all sorts of really interesting work going on. But the freedom of the novel as someone, either as someone who's experienced those big historical changes yourself or as from, you know, from later on or a, an observer's perspective is that you can play with the form. You're not, you're not saying that um, you have absolute proof that X, Y, Z happened. What you're saying is that if X, Y, Z happened, this is, this is the reasons why, this is the psychology behind it, these are the consequences of it. And you can explore those things, I think, much more fully than you can when you're really trying to measure this document against that document, which history has to do because it's aiming at some kind of science. Um, so first, I just wanted to thank you all for being here. Um, and you all spoke and have written so beautifully. Um, but this is a question for Mariana. Uh, and you spoke about um, what the body means to you, sort of historically and also emotionally. And um, in Things We Lost in the Fire, something that I noticed was motherhood and mothers and the relationship, particularly between mothers and daughters, uh, reoccurring. And I was wondering, for you, what the connection or the sort of uh, very material relationship between bodies and motherhood and sort of birth and how those two themes interact both in, in, in real life in the material world and also in your creative process and in the way that you intellectually uh, mapped out this collection. It's funny that, uh, the, that so many uh, mothers and children appear because I, I'm not a mother and I don't want to be a mother. 
and uh, I don't really like children. <laughs> so um, they're nice, no? <laughs> but uh, it's not. It's not. Uh, well, no. It's not an experience I want to have. So to me, it's profoundly mysterious. And s since I'm very interested in the mystery, to me, it's not. It's never been a natural thing to me. It's never been. I always. I was talking just with a friend today about this, just casually. I always felt that my body was not prepared for bearing children. Like it was a body. I know it's a female body, and it should procreate. procreate I guess, but to me. It doesn't do that, okay? I don't know why. It's like, it doesn't do that. So to me, it's very um, mysterious. And I, I'm very interested in the mystery of things. And um, sometimes when I read about motherhood and birth and, st and stuff, things seem very natural, thing, things is ver seems very like life, like the circle of life, and to me, being a person that decided that the circle of lives ends here, that possibility is very weird. So I really like to, I know how this sounds, but I really like to, to explore it from that, uh, from that point of view. And, um, and I also, s since it's um, uh, an experience that I decided I won't have, Having it in the imagination in, and in literature, even if everybody suffers a lot, the children suffer, the mother suffers, but um, it's a way of living it vicariously. It's like I don't need it because I can, I, I, I can do it there, uh, something like that. And also, but it would be tremendously long if I had to get into my mother. <laughs> but um, well, she's very nice. <laughs> No, she is. She's very nice. Uh, but, uh, but, but yeah, it's a very strong woman. And, uh, you know, I'm, every mother and daughter relationship is weird. But um, this, this is uh, it's not m probably not more weird than yours. But, uh, but yeah, um, it's interesting to, to think about a woman like that being a mother. And, you know... I think uh, it comes from amazement that people do something as difficult as birth to me. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, or is everybody just cold as hell? <laughs> <laughs> These guys are freezing and there's goosebumps. Um, You've been an amazing audience. Uh, thank you so much, Jaolu Guo, Mariana Enriquez, Nadifa Mohammed. Um, please stick around and get a book, uh, and they will sign them. Um, Mariana will sign hers in blood, uh, and you're welcome to go inside and get them. 